Here we go. Now I'm unmuted. Um, I think we'll go ahead and give this a go. Um, we can let some people know that they trickle in. Um, I want to say hello and good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining us for our third Living with Liver Disease session of 2022. My name is Carrie Fresnel, Development Coordinator in Alberta, and I'll be the moderator and host for this session. I'd like to start by acknowledging that the Canadian Liver Foundation's national office in Markham, Ontario, is situated upon the traditional territories of the Anish Inaw Bay peoples of the Holmi Sahne peoples covered by the Upper Canadian Treaty. I would also like to acknowledge that this section is open to Canadians across all traditional territories. The CLF's Living with Liver Disease program has been around for more than 25 years and it continues to serve as an educational tool for both patients and caregivers, but also as a peer support tool. This program provides an opportunity to increase community-based learning about liver disease and the importance of liver health in hopes to reduce the incidence and impact of liver disease through prevention, early diagnosis, treatment and care with geographical barriers, without geographical barriers. Speakers include healthcare providers, allied health professionals, subject matter experts, as well as patient advocates. So to get a better idea of who our audience members are today and where they're tuning in from, we'll open two short polls that will pop up on your screen. So please take a second and give that a little answer. Perfect. Thank you for your input. Perfect. So as we can see, can we share that now? Ah, there we go. So as you can see, most or most people at the session today are some are people living with liver disease. That's important to know. Mine, yeah. yeah, did you are you supposed to take them? Huh? Not supposed to take them. There you go. Don't take them. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna carry on. Today's uh, session will address coping with liver disease and the personal and societal impact of NAFLD and NASH, with International NASH Day coming up on June 9th. We're joined by our presenter, Dr. Mark Swain from the University of Calgary. We'll have Dr. Swain complete his presentation and then move to a question and answer portion. Please feel free to use the tap chat feature at the bottom of the Zoom screen to ask your questions during the presentation and note that quest questions will be answered following the speaker's presentation. Following Q&A, we'll be hosting breakout room sessions. This will provide an opportunity for our community members across the country to talk about their journeys openly and safely, share insights, stories, tips, and suggestions with others who may be going through the same thing in their respected local, regional, or provincial area. For those who are not familiar with breakout rooms, it's a feature within the Zoom platform that allows people to split into smaller groups within the meeting. The groups are split into regions or provinces, uh, so we do suggest you join the group that best fits your geographical location. Uh, if you find yourself not sure which group to join, one of our moderators and staff members will assign you to a group. The great breakout rooms will be running for about 30 minutes, depending on how long the presentation is. So today's session will be recorded and available on the Canadian Liver Foundation website, www.liver.ca as well as our Facebook and YouTube page in the coming days. 
In respecting our members' privacy, the breakout room sessions following the talk will not be recorded. So for those of you who are new to this program and may not be familiar with the Canadian Liver Foundation, the CLF was established in 1969 and was the first organization in the world created to help people with liver disease. We are committed to promoting liver health and improving the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of liver disease through our four core pillars, research, education, patient support, and advocacy. At this time, I would like to welcome our speaker, Dr. Mark Swain. Dr. Swain is a practicing hepatologist and professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of Calgary. He is also the head of the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology, also at the University of Calgary. So Dr. Swain, I invite you to take the floor and take it away. Thank you very much. And, uh... Welcome everyone. I look forward to chatting with you tonight. Um, just going to uh, share my screen here. So my uh, my uh, my talk tonight is on the personal and societal impact of NAVLD and NASH, and uh, I, I think it's uh, a very good topic, obviously, because it's uh, it's a common uh, liver issue, but. Uh, uh, Na Nash Day is uh, is uh, coming up. It's actually on Thursday, and so um, I think it's imp very important that we highlight this as a, as as an important health uh, and liver condition. Um, so, first of all, what is fatty liver? And people will often use the word steatosis, and uh, steatosis just means essentially fat in a tissue. Um, and so when one's thinking of fatty liver, this is a normal liver. So it's that pinky liver that you might see at a supermarket or whatever. And, and uh, when, a when you develop fatty liver, it actually develops this sort of yellowy kind of uh, color. And, and, uh, and it, uh, I guess, looks a, bit, a little bit like, say, butter or whatever. And, uh, and it's all usually enlarged. And when you when you sort when you take a biopsy, this is what a normal liver looks like. So you can see that the liver cells are kind of pinkish, and these little these dark blue circles that's actually the nucleus of the cell. And these and the cells in the liver form these sort of columns, and the blood flows between them along these little white areas here. And so that's the normal structure of a liver. But you can see here when you get fatty liver, these liver cells get filled uh, full of lipid or fat. And they get kind of swollen and it sort of distorts somewhat the art. It can distort the architecture. So it's sort of a little hard to see where, that, where these little channels are here when you look at that liver. And when, when, uh, when often people are found to have fatty liver disease or NAFLD uh, uh, when they go for an ultrasound. And so I just wanted to give you an idea of what they're looking at when they look at a liver uh, in, uh, with an ultrasound and what tells them that the liver is, uh, is actually has some excess fat in it. The, the ultrasound can pick it up fat, but as it starts to go, get close to around 20% of the liver cells have fat in them, so 15 to 20%. And you can see here, this is the sound beep. This is, this is where they would put the little transducer on your abdomen, and it shoots the sound beam down through your liver. And you can actually see the diaphragm, which is the big breathing muscle at the bottom of your lungs, which helps us breathe. And so in a normal liver, you can see you get a very nice penetration of that beam through, and you can see the different structures in the liver, but it, but as you start to get to get uh, fat in the liver, um, what what you start to see is you start to see it, it starts to look whiter, and that's because it's bouncing the sound beam, beams back back towards you essentially. And uh, as you get more and more fats, this is called grade one when you're starting to see that that. Uh, white cloudiness. Grade two is that you actually start to, the, the sound beam can't get through the liver. So you start to, it looks black down here because this is the, the, uh, the sound beam can't reach that far. And so if there was something down here, like a little small tumor or something like that, they wouldn't be able to, it wouldn't be able to be seen. And then what you see here is in grade three is that you essentially lose the capacity to almost see anything in the liver. And so it's and it becomes problematic if you're if you're looking for something in particular. But this is what someone would call severe steatosis. 
So when do, when does fatty liver become a liver disease, or, or as I like to think of it, is when does fat, when does fatty liver turn bad? Uh, and when it turns bad, we actually start to call it NASH. And I'll tell you the difference between fatty liver and NASH and NAFLD. So the terms that people use most commonly, so people will use the word fatty liver, but often I think nowadays people are using NAFLD. There's a push to change the name, but I'm not going to talk about that tonight. But NAFLD stands for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And NASH stands for non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So steato is just a fancy word from Latin meaning fat. And hepatitis just means liver inflammation. So steatohepatitis is just fat causing liver inflammation. And you can't, there's no way of picking up NASH essentially unless you do a liver biopsy because it's actually a histological diagnosis. Whereas fat in the liver, you can pick up by ultrasound like I just showed you. But it's important to recognize that NAFLD is a diagnosis of exclusion. So you have to rule out other cause of liver disease. And, and, and that includes a daily cutoff amount of alcohol intake and uh, uh, the amount uh, that might cause fat in the liver because alcohol uh, is a, if you drink enough, it's going to cause fatty liver. Um, the amount that the cutoff amount is really debated quite a bit on, you know, uh, how much, to, how much, to, uh, is acceptable to drink before it becomes is alcohol related or non-alcohol related. So as I mentioned, alcohol uh, is is a, is one of the key causes of fatty liver disease in its own right. So if people drink enough alcohol, everyone that drinks enough alcohol will get fatty liver. Uh, and I, in fact, if you take a liver biopsy of some with alcohol related fatty liver disease and some with non-alcohol related fatty liver disease, and you look at the, at them under the microscope, they look very similar. And uh, and so really the way you differentiate them is by history, by saying, hey, do you drink much alcohol? How much do you drink? And that sort of thing. And this is why people often ask people about drinking, uh, drinking alcohol. Uh, it's not that they're trying to pin them down about how much alcohol they drink. It's just that the only way you can differentiate alcohol-related fatty liver disease from non-alcohol fatty liver disease is actually through history or the main way. Uh, and there's growing evidence that, that alcohol intake at any level is uh, probably uh, dangerous. Uh, however, it's currently recommendation that for men up to two drinks a day and for women up to one standard drink a day is, 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 uh, is, is an acceptable alcohol intake. Mind you, if you're starting to get scarring of the liver, then, then that level uh, drops off dramatically. So it's also important to recognize that NAFLD and NASH, they're actually a spectrum of liver disease. It's not just one thing. So here's a normal liver. And then as I showed you before, steatosis, you can see all these little sort of uh, spaces where it seems like the liver has been punched out. Well, those, th those, these are just cells that are full of fat and the fat drops out when you, when you uh, fix the tissue. When you start to get NASH, you're getting scarring of the liver, which is this blue stuff. And the pink is the liver cells, and, the, and these are the is the fatty droplets. And you're also starting to get inflammation here. You're starting to see immune cells coming into the liver, and those immune cells are attacking these these liver cells that have fat in them, and uh, and in fact is getting rid of them and, and replacing them with scar tissue. And as you get more and more scar tissue, this is really Nash with advanced uh, fibrosis. And in fact, if you want to look at it differently, so when, when people get a liver biopsy or people are talking about scarring in their liver with NASH, <clears throat> uh, they, they, they talk about fibrosis being F stage or stages. So F0 is, is no increase in scarring in the liver. F1 is when you start to see these little patchy areas of the blue is scar tissue. And so the normal liver would have no scar tissue coming out from here. But so you're starting to see scar tissue form here, but it's actually quite mild here. So that's a one out of four. A two out of four, it's starting to spread more. And you can actually see here that it's starting to surround individual liver cells. And that's actually called chicken wiring. That's the sort of name that they because if you know what a chicken wiring looks like in a farm or whatever, it sort of has these kind that kind of shape. And so it's the scar tissue going around individual cells, uh, which is quite striking often in, uh, in uh, uh, NASH. When you get to three out of four or F3 fibrosis, you're starting to see you're getting bands form. So you're getting this blue bands that are joining up these different areas. And those blue bands start to, to isolate 
pockets of liver cells. And when you actually get enough of that blue band scarring and you start to get nodularity in the livers, this is a nodule, you can see it's being surrounded by scar tissue. This is when people talk about cirrhosis. So stage four is cirrhosis. And, it, and this is how the liver becomes lumpy bumpy. So if you see pictures of kind of a lumpy bumpy liver, it's really this nodularity that's formed by the scars bands forming around the liver cells. This is kind of what it looks like. So when, when you look at a normal liver, it's very smooth on the outside. So if someone goes for a CAT scan or an ultrasound or an MRI and people say, hey, the liver, maybe the radiologist might say the liver looks a bit cirrhotic. What they're noticing is that you're starting to get this waviness and this nodularity or lumpy bumpiness on the outside of the liver, which you don't have here. And that's really what they're looking at unless it's very advanced. So what causes NAF? Well, there are a number of different things that can cause, but the main two drivers of, uh, of, uh, of uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease are obesity and diabetes. Fats in the blood or high cholesterol can also contribute and certain medications as well. And there's growing evidence that there's some genetic uh, inheritance that can happen uh, in, in certain ethnic groups mainly. And if you look globally at NAFLD or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, about 24% of the population in, uh, in the world, actually, and in, in Canada, about 24% of the adult population has NAFLD, and about 2 to 3% are going to have NASH. So this is an extremely common uh, uh, issue. When you actually look at, the, uh, at, at where NAFLD is most prevalent, in the world, so the, where it's seen more commonly in the population, it actually directly parallels uh, the, uh, the caloric availability to that population. So the more access a population has to calories, uh, then the higher uh, uh, prevalence of uh, NAFLD, and that's really what this shows. So once, so as you go up in the amount of calories that, that are available per day, you can see that the NAFLD prevalence increases in parallel. And really, modern life is a key driver of NAFLD. It's uh, as our as our our work changes, and so we become more sedentary. And and as we live in cities, it's harder to get out, and we and we just become more sedentary. Our food choices become different from what they used to be on a farm a long time ago, or whatever, or uh, when we lived in sort of more rural society. And so we're eating things that have very low fiber high high saturated fats and high carbohydrate. And this is the classic sort of things that drive fatty liver disease. And then of course, a huge contributor is this high fructose corn syrup, which is used as a sweet, it's very sweet. So it's used as a sweetener in, in many things, but uh, pop is a huge issue, uh, uh, which, because they use a lot of high fructose. You see it's water and then high fructose corn syrup to make it sweet. And, uh, Humans can't metabolize fructose well, and so when they, when they, when you uh, eat or drink fructose, it actually causes the liver cells to start to make fat inside them, and it also changes how fat's distributed in the body, and uh, and and this becomes a huge driver of NASH. Actually, is is the high fructose that people take. If you want to, if you want to induce cirrhosis in a mouse, you feed them a high fructose diet, and you'll get a cirrhotic mouse. And, and if you look at, at, at uh, um, obesity in, in, in North America and, and, and certainly in Alberta, you can see that that, that there's a, that obesity is, is quite prevalent, but also it's increasing in in, 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 in in its prevalence. So every year it goes higher, and you can see in Alberta it, it, it's roughly twenty percent of the population would be defined as being obese. But if you go down to Mississippi, that's over a third of the population. And this was back in 2014. So this has gone significantly higher than that since that time. And, and if you look at, at diabetes uh, uh, in, in Alberta over time, you can see that this is just rising every year. It goes higher and higher and higher. And so this is back in 2019, it was about 6.5% of the population. I think it's closer to 7.5% of the population now. So diabetes and obesity are paralleling each other and increasing dramatically each year. And in fact, if, if you look at, at, a, at a population, so this is in 2019, and you have 10 people uh, uh, that more than six diabetics and nine people that are severely overweight, 
uh, out of 10 are going to have NAFLD. And, and if you look at, if you don't even uh, look at weight, you just look at the whole population, about one out of four are going to have NAFLD. So it's extremely common and it's growing in prevalence. And in fact, you may have heard of something called the metabolic syndrome. Well, fatty liver or fatty liver disease is actually considered the liver manifestation of metabolic syndrome. So what is metabolic syndrome? A well, metabolic syndrome is that you have, this is triglycerides are a certain kind of fat that's most people are familiar with cholesterol, but triglycerides and, and cholesterol float around in the blood. And so high triglycerides, uh, low good cholesterol. So HDL is the good cholesterol. It's usually associated with high bad cholesterol, which is LDL. Visceral fat. So visceral, visceral obesity means ob uh, that weight that's around the middle section. Insulin resistance, and these go hand in hand. And if you get enough insulin resistance, that's what, we, that's what diabetes is, type 2 diabetes, and high blood pressure. And these are the classic hallmarks of metabolic syndrome. So when someone's talking about metabolic syndrome, they're talking about these things. And when you talk about visceral adiposity or visceral fat or visceral obesity, this is what they're really talking about. So the apple shape, so if the fat is around the middle, that's visceral adiposity. And visceral adiposity surrounds the organs. It's in the, it's in the, it's in the abdomen. And this is really a much more metabolically active than if your weight is in the lower part. So the apple shape, which is more classically the female shape. This type of fat is much less metabolically active and is less of a driver of metabolic syndrome than this fat. So what's the traditional approach for, for finding uh, and managing that fatty liver disease in people in the general population who, who may or may not be within at-risk groups, but more so if people are in an at-risk at group, are there strategies on trying to identify people that might have a liver problem so we can actually intervene and, and try to help, uh, help people from progressing to significant liver disease? And, and the question always is, I mean, it used to be that the feeling was that NAFLD was a benign thing. And I, I remember telling people, you know, seven, 10 years ago that, that NAFLD was a benign thing. It didn't progress, but we know that's not correct now. And we have very good evidence that, that there are people that are uh, at significant risk of progressive disease. We just didn't have good ways of identifying them in the past. And so you, we used to believe we we're just cruising along and everything was great, but we know we're, we're not here, but we're somewhere in the middle here. Uh, with regards to, uh, you know, what's the reality of how serious this is? Certainly, if people have advanced liver fibrosis, then it's a very serious disease. And in fact, NAFLD is becoming the, the biggest indication for liver transplantation in uh, most developed countries. And so what's the impact of NAFLD and ASH on the liver as a driver for the development of progressive liver disease? So worsening liver disease. Well, when you look at people with NASH, so that's the in, really the more the inflammatory component uh, that that is is linked to liver injury, and you look at the scarring, it's actually become it's become increasingly apparent that the scarring is the main driver of progressive liver disease. And so once someone has that two out of four, which I showed you in that picture, when you're starting to get those tendrils of scar tissue that are spreading around the liver, which is called a two out of four. Those are the people that we know that once they have that, they've started this march this way. These group of people seem to do well for a very long time. But once you're F2, you're, you're gonna, then over time you're progressed to F3, which, uh, which is pre-cirrhotic and then F4 is cirrhosis. So when you have liver cirrhosis, of course, then you're at risk of developing liver failure and, liver, and you have about a 3% chance per year of developing liver cancer. So these people, are the people that are, you know, you're considering for transplant and things like that. But there's also, uh, so that's the impact of NAPLD, I think, on the society. And, and we're trying to talk about scarring in the liver as a driver of their worsening liver disease. But there's also a, an impact of NAPLD and NASH on an individual at a personal level. Really how it impacts their, their mind and their, and their perception of their health and of themselves. There's actually a study that, that really just recently came out where they interviewed a group of people with, with uh, NAFLD and NASH to try to get an idea of what are the key symptoms which are relevant and important to people that have NASH. And so this is our, our, the percentage of people that are reporting the symptoms up to 100%. And you can see that, that, they're, that, that 
people experiencing uh, discomfort in the right upper quadrant, so that's the right upper part of the abdomen, is over uh, is almost uh, uh, two thirds of the of people. Achiness, fatigue, again, is uh, sixty percent of people recording record fatigue, and forty percent low energy levels. Itchiness, in forty to forty five percent. Poor sleep quality, very common, over half. Uh, forgetfulness, brain fog, difficulty remembering things, about uh, over half the people are reporting that. And then a reduced ability to focus on things, which these are tied together, again, about half the people. So although often people say that NASH and NAFLD are asymptomatic diseases, you can see quite clearly that's not correct, that, that these diseases really impact people from a symptom level. And then those symptoms broadly or how it impacts someone's life impact uh, something called their quality of life. And this is health related quality of life. And so these are some of the health related quality of life things that people with, with, with uh, uh, NAFL and NASH report. And you can see there's limitations of, of activity, which happens in up to a third of people. It impacts people's social behavior. So, you know, participating in activities, whether or not they eat out, um, their engagement and leisure activities and hobbies. You know, this is a quarter of people. This is almost half here. And then also impacts people's relationships. You can see it impacts their role in a relationship, their interactions with their children and their grandchildren, uh, you know, uh, their impact on others, impact on interactions with friends. That's about a quarter of the individuals. And then when you look at healthy eating, you know, people uh, um, are thinking about uh, when they do any kind of eating activity, they're constantly thinking about healthy eating choices and and uh, and that they're being that, you know, they should restrict themselves, their diets, uh, trying to move towards a bland diet. So these are things that are constantly in people's thought process associated with with eating habits uh that and the pressures uh you know to pick a healthy choice uh, as opposed to something that that might be uh something that they they actually would rather eat um and then uh, stigma is a huge issue almost almost half the people reported uh, uh, the emotional impact of fatty liver disease to impact them on an emotional level and irritability anxiety worry low mood depression this is a quarter of people so this is, these are huge, huge impacts at a personal level. And, and the issue with stigma and self-esteem in all liver disease is a, is a, is a huge problem. And that's a big issue with, with, uh, as it relates to uh, getting a voice with policymakers and having people stand up and be willing to say, I've got liver disease and, I, and we need more resources or we need, uh, we need more attention paid at a, at a national and, and provincial level. Uh, and and it, it, this is something that, 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 that is one of the most challenging aspects of all liver disease is not, not just NAFLD and NASH, but it ha plays a huge impact in NAFLD and NASH. Actually, this very interesting study came out recently where they put all of these things together. This is sort of a summary of that. And what they looked at was they said there was risk factors, which were often high BMI and diabetes were two key risk factors that tied into NASH. And then psychological aspects of each individual, which might be attitude, motivation, eating habits, which are everyone's in, uh, an individual and, and approaches these things in their own way. But all of these go together to impact all of these main symptoms, which I talked about. And and then they in turn can impact activity, social interactions, and having a psychological impact with emotional and, and self-confidence. And then all of these can feed into an economic impact because of course, if these are very active, then work productivity, ability to work, um, uh, uh, the costs uh, that are, are associated with with uh, uh, lifestyle management, which is a multi multi billion dollar industry, costs of medications, these are all huge things, and all of these intertwine to impact uh, people's perception of themselves and their and, and their and their uh, their fatty liver disease. And interesting, this study just came out. It actually doesn't even have a have a, a volume number yet. Uh, by uh, Zobar Yunasi's group, uh, and what they what they actually looked at is they looked at a group of people that had na that Nash and and significant fibrosis. These were people within a clinical trial, and what they found was that the people that had worse fatigue at baseline. So this is before they started the clinical study. 
they actually had a higher risk of adverse clinical events uh, uh, than 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 uh, than people that did not have, that that had less fatigue. So this is the first study in Nash, and it's been shown in some of the some other uh, livers and other chronic diseases that fatigue is not something that's just oh well, I'm feeling tired. Fatigue actually seems to drive outcomes which are clinical outcomes. These are things like liver uh, progression of liver disease, liver failure, liver transplantation. And I'm sure we're gonna hear a lot more about this as time goes forward. So what's the, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about ma managing uh, uh, NAFLD and, and really trying to turn the tide on, on the liver consequences of, uh, of uh, fatty liver disease. So the, so the, the, mo the key sort of focus uh, at the start is actually to optimize non-liver treatments for people with NAFLD in, uh, in, in the primary care setting. So optimize the control of diabetes and we're moving, we're shifting uh, more more quickly to drugs like semaglutide uh, and uh, that are these newer drugs that actually not only are associated with improvement in diabetic control, but they're actually also associated with beneficial effects with mobilizing with regards to weight loss and mobilizing fat out of the liver. Control the hyperlipidemia, so you want to want to get lower the LDL or bad cholesterol, and if you can raise the the good cholesterol, which is usually through exercise, if you can do that, and then treating hypertension because interestingly, hypertension is actually a driver of worse liver disease outcomes, and we're not sure how those uh, how hypertension is linked to that, but it's obviously or very likely linked through. Uh, um, being a, a major component of the metabolic syndrome. And then the weight loss strategy is really a revolve around low, low carbohydrates, uh, less saturated fats and removing fructose. If, it, if, a, if someone's a pop drinker, then, then just actually uh, switching to a diet pop can have a, a tremendous impact on, uh, on, on, uh, on their liver disease. We also have to develop strategies on how we're gonna find people out there in the general population. So within primary care, who are at risk of progressive liver disease uh, and may benefit from seeing a liver specialist, but there's, but right now we don't have things in place that we can identify them and make sure they get to see a liver specialist. And so, so we need there need to be a, the the development and implementation of clin, what are called clinical care pathways. So this is guides to primary care physicians, so they can follow people and know how, wh which is the best way uh, to to make sure that they get into the stream of of care which is best for them. And we need to understand that there are some groups that are at higher risk, and they and they need to be actually sought out and and, and be offered ways of finding out whether or not they have significant liver disease or not. Uh, and then to put them into these care streams, which actually even people, most most people with NAFLD don't require ever seeing a liver specialist. And in fact, we we implemented a, one of these kind of pathways in uh, in uh, Calgary. Uh, and what we did was we worked with primary care physicians to sort of say, what can we do to optimize your ability to find patients that are at risk of significant liver uh, complications and funnel them to see a liver specialist and the ones that aren't at risk uh, uh, then make sure that they don't, that, that you manage their, them holistically without, without focusing on their liver. And what we did in Alberta, in Calgary, is we use an ultrasound-based technique called shear wave elastography, and, and 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 this can be applied to existing community-based ultrasound machines with a software upgrade. And this has been done extensively in Calgary. It's validated in NAFLD, and it's a way of showing how stiff one's liver is. The stiffer the liver is, then the more concern is that there's significant fibrosis. Significant fibrosis or scarring is the precursor we know of progressive liver disease. And these are the people that that likely or may likely uh, very, very well benefit from seeing a liver specialist. And what we found was that by using these techniques in primary care, that over 90% of people were at low risk and they actually did not need to see a liver specialist. And they could have this scan repeated every three years. As long as they stayed in that low risk category, then they would never need to see a liver specialist. And, and it's markedly uh, increased our capacity to see people that have liver related complications and, and, and have the other people that do not have a liver issue be seen uh, and managed uh, with regards to their diabetes, hypertension and, uh, and weight loss and other things that it can be uh, best facilitated through primary care. 
So what about managing an, a, a, a NAFLD and NASH? And this is sort of the pyramid that we look at when we're talking about managing NAFLD and NASH. And so really it's lifestyle modification. These are the core base things in the pyramid and targeting components of the metabolic syndrome. So what are the dietary approaches to NASH? Well, first of all, I don't use the word diet because diet by definition means deprivation. As soon as someone starts to talk about diet, it's almost inevitably doomed to failure. So it's really a, a, a it's trying to approach eating in a different way. And, uh, and, and, that, and that way uh, it can often involve not, not something like going on, uh, on fasting or a keto diet or things like this, but actually trying to switch what is consumed during the day, cut back fats, uh, sorry, cut back carbohydrates, which is a key driver. Uh, and that's why the keto diet, the zone diet, the Atkins diets, all of those diets are, are just different versions of a low carb diet. Low saturated fats, if you, if you can, a Mediterranean type diet, which which is really this over here, which we'll talk about in a second, which is the it's kind of the optimal diet for liver and overall health. And a key thing is reducing fructose. Coffee is felt to be beneficial for the liver. So this is caffeinated coffee and there's actually no limit. It seems like the more you drink, the better the liver likes it. Obviously, if you're you know, so jazzed up on coffee that you can't sleep and, you, and you're shaking, and then that's probably too much coffee. But, but uh, if you can and you like coffee, then two to three cups a day, as long as you're not doing like a double-double uh, uh, sort of thing from Tim Hortons, which is basically just a sugar drink, uh, uh, and, and using sort of black drip coffee that has milk or even or, or cream in it without adding sugar and using a non-sugar sweetener, then that, then that has a beneficial effect on the liver. And then a Mediterranean diet is trying to increase the fiber in the diet, try to eat more fish, more vegetables, try to cut down the cholesterol and the saturated fats that are, that, that, that are in the diet, uh, olive oil, using olive oil and trying to cut back sugar. That's really the mainstays of a Mediterranean diet or a Mediterranean approach. What about some of the future pharmacological therapies that are coming down the pipeline for NASH? I'm just going to touch on a few today, and really because it, it's complicated. There are so many drugs that are being developed to treat NASH. It's it's really mind-boggling, and we're and uh, you know I, I I think there's you know hundreds of drugs that are being that that are that are being looked at at, at different levels with regards to targeting different components of NAFLD. And you can see NAFLD is a very complicated uh, system and many different pathways are involved. And you can see all of these different drugs in the, in the pink are, are, have been targeted at different parts of the pathway. So what are some of the liver-directed uh, pharmacotherapies or drugs that are coming along? Well, there are some drugs that are targeting the whole spectrum, but we know that really the people that are at risk of progressive disease are F2 scarring, whoops, F2 scarring and above. But really the people that are that are most in desperate need of treatments now are people that have pre-cirrhosis, so through F3, or people that have cirrhosis. Sorry about that. And uh and so this is really where, where the first drugs will, will most likely be approved, is targeting people with, the, with, with that, that, uh, that level of scarring. So, so what are the top contenders for the drugs to treat NASH? Well, there's this drug called an FXR agonist, which sounds pretty fancy, but if actually you saw the whole name, you'd really realize that it's, it's tough to say. But FXR agonists are very interesting drugs. They're actually derivatives of bile acids, which we have in our body anyways. And we and that's what we that's kind of the human detergent, our bile acids. And they come out and they get stored in our gallbladders and they go into our gut to help us absorb fats. But it's, they've known for a long time that by that these type of certain types of bile acids, and the one that's the I'm going to talk about here is a beta tocolic acid or OCA is the short form it actually stimulates this receptor and it does all of these things it seems to reduce inflammation uh, in the liver it's it it seems to be able to reduce uh, scarring and actually increase repair it actually regulates bile levels and bile flow it re, it, it decreases fatty uh, sort of fatty acid or lipid synthesis uh, uh, or so fat synthesis and, and damage caused by that in the liver and it actually also seems to improve insulin sensitivity. 
which are all hallmarks of fatty liver disease. And uh, in, the, in the, uh, the study that's been published to date, there's another study that's going to be coming along very, very shortly. And if that one's positive, then I think this drug will be shift into gears to try to get onto the market relatively soon after that, uh, relatively soon in the broad scheme of drug development, which is actually not soon enough. Uh, but wh what they found when they, so this is increasing dose, this is placebo. And these are increasing doses of OCA. And this is looking at scarring in the liver. And what they found is that actually the scarring got better at, at, with this drug. When this was the first drug ever to show an improvement in scarring in the liver was just by using a drug. But the interesting thing is when they looked at the inflammation, which is the NASH component, it didn't make an impact on, uh, on and, and people don't understand why those are separate. I, I'm gonna show you some more data which suggests that there's something going on here that we don't understand. And this is what feeds into potentially combination therapy. So there's, so semaglutide uh, was, so people know it as Ozempic or these type of drugs is advertised all the time on TV now. It's a, it, it interacts with this thing called GLP-1 and it, it stimulates GLP-1. And it does many different things. It decreases gastric emptying. It has impacts on the brain. It makes people less, it decreases their appetite actually. And so people are less inclined to eat. It reduces glucose production or sugar production out of the liver. And the liver is a main producer of, of sugar. It actually increases glucose uptake by muscles and fat tissue. So it gets it out of the circulation. And it also changes the pancreas. So it increases insulin secretion and it decreases the glucagon, which is the acts in the opposite way of insulin. And so the main things it does, it reduces appetite and increases the feeling of fullness. As I say, it improves insulin sensitivity. So this, obviously, if you're eating less and you're increasing insulin sensitivity, that's going to improve diabetes. But the part that really uh, I think is very appealing to, to to these drugs and why they've actually just taken off even beyond diabetes is they that weight loss is very common with these drugs. And so they're being used more and more and more as primary for weight loss and not for diabetes. And then the question was always, is there an effect on the liver? Uh, this just shows you, so this is where these class of drugs kind of fit in. And then there's the an, another type of drugs that help you lose sugar out of the, in the urine. And that's where they act there. But I'm just talking about this one right now. And you can see this is a study where they looked at, at, at using Ozempic uh, for weight reduction. And you can see this, there's placebo and there's Ozempic or semaglutide. You can see this is a, a dramatic fall in, in, uh, in uh, weight. You can see this is a 16% weight loss there. I mean, that, that, that's huge. What about, what about the effect on the liver? Well, if you look on the liver, so this is the increasing dose of semaglutide, and then this is placebo. You can see that compared to placebo at the highest dose of semaglutide, there was an improvement in the liver inflammation or NASH component, which was you know, quite, quite evident and quite exciting. However, when you looked at scarring, there wasn't a change. So this is the opposite of the obeta tocolic acid or OCA study. And so there's a lot of interest in, well, if we combine these two, can we get the most of both, uh, best of both words, but, uh, worlds? But also, is, it, is these, are these studies just not long enough to start to show that they're uh, an effect on, 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 uh, on scar? You can see that you would, you know, there almost is a bit of a, a bit of a trend here that they seem to be higher, but they're not significant statistically. So, so the question is really is what is the best target in NASH? Is it the fat? Because there's drugs designed just to remove fat out of the liver. Is it the scarring, which is really we know drives uh, a NASH to the endpoints that no one wants to, to see, which is liver failure, liver transplantation, liver cancer, or is it the inflammation? So you're targeting the steatosis, the NASH component, or the fibrosis component? Well, as I mentioned before, really the way this field is going is combination therapies. So at least two of these targets in the same sort of uh, therapeutic approach. I think the ultimate hope is that we're, we're going to be able to have precision or personalized medicine, which I think people are going to hear more and more about for fatty liver disease. So for each individual, we give them the right medicine or mixture of medicines 
at the right time. And so they get the benefits without the side effects. So you don't treat the whole, everyone with the same sort of approach, but the, but the approach uh, uh, treatment is geared towards each individual for their own individual needs and makeup. And I'm uh, that's the end of my talk. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Dr. Swain. You know what, every time I think, okay, I'm gonna go through, I'm gonna hear your, your presentation, I'm gonna find some really awesome questions to really stump you on, and I, you know, I just never can. You get me every time. Um, does anyone else, here, I'm gonna start my video. Does anyone else have any questions? Um, I, I do have one, sorry, I'll just butt in and it's, it's you might think it's silly, Dr. Swain, but um, would you ever- No, so, no such thing as a silly question. <laughs> Would, do you think doctors at some point or now, would they prescribe those um, prescription medications to people before stage three to avoid stage three? Or do they so, not do that? So will they, they'll, will they provide those medications to what exactly, sorry? To people in stage one and two that, you know, yeah. could still prevent from, you know, scarring. scarring. Well, the current evidence that people who are in, in uh, who are in stage uh, zero or one, their risk of progression over the next ten years is extremely low, and and so you'd be treating a, a lot of people with with drugs that are, are are not inexpensive, and they all you know every drug has a side effect, and so with potential side effects when they when there's no evidence that they they uh, they would need them and need them now, and uh, and so we'll. Things change, uh, you know. I, uh, through time, uh, people often target diseases earlier on, but um, and, and so I think that people will target fighting liberties and scarring earlier and earlier on. But I, but uh, it would it be would it be a one out of, of four scarring? I, I think it'll be a long time before we see that, unless there's a drug with almost no side effects that's relatively inexpensive that we could apply to the broad population at large. That'd be a lot of people. What, what is the um, safe upper limit for grams of protein of fructo fructose a day? Well, fructo well, so fructose that comes, it depends on what the source of fructose is. If someone's, I can't tell you an exact upper limit, but I can tell you if your fructose is coming from drinking, uh, eating fruit, say. So if you're yeah. eating a fruit, uh, broadly that 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 that's that is you're not going to get into an issue with uh, with fructose toxicity at, at a liver level. People that drink, say, fruit juice, the problem with fruit juice is that from a nutritional point of view, it has limit very limited. Even though people think oh, I'm going to drink orange juice because it's going to be healthy for me, it's actually not healthy for you, and uh, it has very high uh, glycemic index, so it actually generates a lot of a high sugar level in your blood after you drink it. Uh, and 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 uh, and it has and it does have fructose, but it's actually the glycemic problem that's the biggest issue. Uh, and and if you look at at pop, what they do is they use this this type of fructose, which is is extremely intense and in high amounts of it, and 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 it's it's an unnatural type of fructose that often comes from corn, essentially. And they, I mean, they use corn uh, in 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 feeds in feedlots and things like that because it's a very quick way to to get that fatty marbling in uh, in in a in say a steak or whatever that we might eat and so you know certainly farmers have known forever that the best way to, to you know to to uh to sort of get a get a cow ready to go to go off and be be in a supermarket uh, because of the you know fatty marbling or whatever is to is to feed them fruct fruct you know essentially corn uh, mm -hmm. which is metabolized that same way and so um i actually i actually i would say uh any pop or iced tea or any drinks that are sweetened w with fructose, if I had fatty liver disease, I wouldn't touch them. Uh, you know, people are so concerned about, uh, you know, non-sugar supplements and things like that, or whether it's aspartame or, you know, stevia or whatever. I mean, the risk of those, uh, uh, you know, I think is all theoretical. Uh, uh, and, uh, and the risk of fructose is we see it all the time. And, and I'll tell you, there are people that stop drinking pop and come back and have a fiber scan done. It, it's amazing how their liver stiffness changes and how their liver tests go down and how the fat content of the liver goes down. It's, it, it, it's, it's, it's a extremely gratifying for, for people to make that step and then to see that. 
Oh, and I would say no soccer. Sorry. I, I, um, my diet consisted of basically fruit for weeks on end before things kind of settled down. So I was just wondering if, you know, eating fruit constantly from morning till night was <laughs> obviously too much, but. Well, yeah, yeah, like anything. So those natural fructose, if you're going to pick, I, you know, and, and it was a choice between that or a soft drink or whatever, mm. for sure. Uh, and fruit broadly, you know, there are a lot of healthy aspects to fruit, but fruit, but it's like anything, you know, too much of a good thing might not be such a good thing. And, and so I wouldn't advocate eating fruit every day. I mean, vegetables is a better choice overall, but uh, mm. um, you know, again, I think a balanced diet, and and it's all about proportions of the different things and it's not like don't eat carbohydrates it's about balancing carbohydrates with proteins and vegetables and uh, and so I, I think the the strategy has to be sustainable because i don't know how long you you've you did the fruit all day every day but i mean there's going to be a limit where you're going to start to say i need oh, something other than fruit <laughs> yeah, that's right and so so i think yeah. that you have to do something that's sustainable right and uh i think sometimes you know we get desperate and we Think we need to do something that's sort of very faddish to get kickstarted or whatever and, and, and for some people that that can work i mean because i'm going to do keto diet for this long and or i'm going to do intermittent fasting and i think there are you know benefits to doing those if it helps you get kickstarted but it's not sustainable in the long run mm -hmm. okay thank you yeah uh, so we have one question here uh in the chat it's uh, related to uh cirrhosis in terms of once cirrhosis has developed, um, is uh, the condition itself uh, reversible or uh, depending on, of course, how kind of when it is caught? So I guess the general question, is it uh, reversible or uh, is somebody um, considered advanced stage or, or late stage liver disease? Yeah, that, that's an that's a, that's a interesting question, because if you had have asked me that probably 15 or 20 years ago, I said, oh, no, once cirrhosis is there, it's there forever, and that's it. And uh, we missed the boat. But uh, it's becoming very clear, uh, and it started to become clear when, uh, I mean, we've known for a long time when people have autoimmune hepatitis, and we treat them with immunosuppression, we got good control of it, that in fact, people can go from a, a cirrhotic liver to a pretty much normal liver. And and so we've known that for a long time. But we, I think there was a lot of feeling that was just an autoimmune hepatitis related thing. But as we started to get better therapies for hepatitis B and hepatitis C, and we could we could really remove the ongoing injury that went with those viruses, then we saw it with those, with those uh, diseases too, that we could actually shift from a cirrhotic liver all the way back to a normal liver over, over a number of years. And so this shifted our way of thinking about cirrhosis is, and how the body deals with it about about it's not that when scarring is laid down that is permanent uh but that there's a constant remodeling going and, and the liver can as uh, as i'm sure you you recognize can regenerate so you can cut a half of a normal liver off and it just grows back it's the only organ that does that and 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 so uh if you give the liver a chance if you can get uh, if you can remove that ongoing injury that's driving the scarring from li being laid down, then then the li the liver can actually start to re resorb some of that scar tissue and remodel itself, and and you it it can be very impressive what can happen. And in fact, there's some evidence that that th it's happening all the time. That that if you look at people with even with advanced liver disease, they can move up and down within the, within uh, in the different scar zones. So they could go from an F4 to an F3 in a, in two years, or they can go from an F3 to an F4. So they can bounce back and forth, even without any specific dedicated therapy. So the idea is to try to get something that can target the inflammation in the liver and that might be a drug or it might be lifestyle modifications so that that the ongoing injury goes down and then the liver has that opportunity to remodel itself and so i'm very hopeful that for most people with advanced fibrosis that that when we have when we can really start to focus on interventions that 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 reduce the the ongoing injury in 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 uh, fatty liver disease that we're actually going to see people that are going to have amazing recoveries Great. That's a quick question. I've received, we of course get some quite a bit of information or inquiries from the public uh, with respect to uh, NAFLD or NASH, but also alcohol. Now you touched up on it, it was quite debatable. Is it advised for somebody to consume alcohol regardless of liver disease or even if it's an early stage, uh, NAFLD or, 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 or NASH? Yeah, so. I mean, I always have, I, I debate with many people about that, but uh, I, I mean, if someone, I mean, fatty liver is a quarter of the population. Uh, 
So, so if we look at Napoli and 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 and, uh, and, and our, a lot of our social lives revolves around uh, things we uh, interacting with friends, and some of it's food, some of it's alcohol, some of it's whatever, and. and and I really don't believe that people that don't have advanced scarring in the liver should change their life to a point where that every time they go out, people are asking them about why they're not having a, a glass of wine or something like that. I, I, because that actually adds to the stigma, I think. And, and, and so for sure, if you have F3 or F4 fibrosis, I personally would not be drinking any alcohol. But, but, but you know, people that just have fatty liver disease, uh, I mean, obviously alcohol has, has calories, it has all the other issues with it. But I think if you're drinking anything in moderation and, you know, typically social drinking, you know, two to four drinks a week, I mean, is kind of what most people might drink. Uh, I don't have any issue with that unless people have advanced liver disease. And I always tell people, Try not to make yourself have a disease. I mean, you could argue that fatty liver in its own right without scarring is not a disease. It's a metabolic derangement is how I would think of it. And, 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 and you know, drinking enough alcohol is not going to not going to help the metabolic derangement. But it, but you know what, having having a lower stress, having social interactions, uh, getting out and, and being part of the community actually has huge health benefits. And so I think if someone said, look, I like to go out, you know, with my friends on Friday night and have, uh, you know, one or two uh, drinks, I would never tell them to stop unless they had advanced liver disease. I think the health benefits from that outweigh any potential risk of alcohol. Yeah, no, totally agree. I think kind of the the general or the the rough outline of, of today's talk kind of explains some of those coping mechanisms where people would get a diagnosis of that of NAFLD um, at, at, a, at an earlier stage from their primary care provider or their family doctor. And they're often, I guess, lost uh, while they wait for either additional information from their healthcare provider or perhaps a specialist. And those are some of the questions that often um, come through the Canadian Liver Foundation is what they can do in the meantime. And of course, we address dietary approaches and some of those questions of alcohol. Um, is there anything else that you would recommend, like top three tips or top five tips as to what somebody can do while they wait to get more information from their uh, specialists that they have uh, uh, of NAFLD or NASH? Yeah, uh, certainly, I think try, uh, how, what I always advise is, is, is look at one's diet and try to do the modifications one can do in their diet. I mean, people often talk about, well, I'm trying to get to the gym or whatever. I actually view exercise like that as, as less important as dietary. Uh, uh, and, and often people really have trouble changing their lifestyle to, uh, to incorporate you know, robust physical activities, certainly walking and things like that, that to, uh, being active is important. But I think the dietary changes, and often they can be quite quite mild ones, I guess, is to try to look at at, at things like uh, the carbo carbohydrates that one's eating. If they're if they're if one's drinking pop that's sweetened uh, with fructose, then that that is I would view that as toxic to the liver, basically. Um, and I think so. If people can cut back their their amount of carbohydrate and try to increase other things like pro, what I usually say is protein and, and vegetables, and uh, and and remove pop, then that actually in its own right can make a massive difference. And then of course, metabolic syndrome is called metabolic syndrome because it's abnormal metabolism. And so when you look at people that have met metabolic syndrome, which are the key drivers of fatty liver disease, uh, it are thing there it involves things that are going to potentially kill you that are not liver related. Like if you don't deal with hypertension, then people get strokes and heart attacks. So it's really important to take care of that with your family doctor. If you have diabetes and, you, and, and it's under poor control, then there's all the risks of all the complications of diabetes that are outside the liver, uh, which are quite substantial. And so trying to control your diabetes better, not only will help your liver, but it's gonna help those other things. And, and cholesterol, of course, uh, um, uh, is a contributor to heart disease as well and stroke. So the, all of these things are things that we actually have therapies that we can we can treat. And so I think it's extremely important to uh, to be well connected to your family doctor to uh, to make sure that the things that 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 we know or the interventions that we know that are, that improve uh, uh, improve longevity and improve uh, life are, are 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 addressed. And so the, the whole concept of holistic health is is really embraced. 
How often do you use the, the MELD score for criteria for liver transplant? Like if, oh. like mine's sitting at around 14, I guess, and you know, it yeah. went down to nine and it's back up to 12 and then 14, I, I'm just wondering. Yeah, I mean, MELD is the way of distributing organs in, in Canada. And, uh, and so uh, we use it all the time, essentially. Uh, you know, obviously, when you start to get around 14, I'm sure you've, I don't know if you've been talking to a transplant program, but that's kind of when people start to talk to a transplant programs or, but uh, mm -hmm. I'm not uh, unclear to me why yours is bouncing up and down. But, but, uh, uh, you know, certainly, if it's getting to be 14, 15, and it's around there all the time, then, then I'm sure you're gonna, they'll be talking to you more about, you know, transplantation, things like that. Mm -hmm. But MELD is used, that is the MELD or MELD sodium are the two that are really used to uh, to decide about uh, liver liver organ uh, uh, allotment, basically. But it seems like on that MELD calculation, though, if you even if you put in the higher uh, limits within the criteria, you're still on the higher MELD score anyhow. Like it, it doesn't seem to matter if you put in lower values. It it seems to still stay you know, in the nine, maybe eight range or whatever the case is, even if you're mucking around with the, with the, um, the criteria. Yeah, well, 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 I mean, there are meld calculators, I'm sure that you've yeah. seen online. I think that's what you're probably talking about, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, meld is, a, is a quite a robust system. Uh, the thing is, if you, if you actually look at the people that are transplanted nowadays, uh, the what would have some of the meld score that someone may have been transplanted a number of years ago has changed significantly and people are are much sicker on the wait list right because the number of organs are the demand is high and the number of organs is less and so when you look at the number of people that uh, actually die on a waiting on a liver transplant it's uh, you know 20 30 percent in some of uh, some of the programs so um the MELD scores just get higher and higher and higher. Then, of course, if someone gets a cancer, they get what are called a MELD exception point. So that that accelerates them along that MELD curve, uh, because of course, if you go you know, with a cancer in a certain time frame, then then they would not be an el eligible for a transplant. So people people are jumping around on that list all the time because of these different things that intervene. And sometimes, if they get an infection, they might have a high MELD score, but they then are taken off the list right until they, that's all resolved. So, uh, you know, I, I would view the MELD, I would view the MELD score as a way of of predicting, you know. It really, it's a way of predicting your chance of dying over certain periods of time, right? And that's really what it does: is it gives people an estimate of what's your risk of dying over certain periods of time. But we also know that if people people have a lowish MELD score and get transplant, then then they have a risk of dying at, with transplant just with the surgery. But then, of course, I mean, having someone else's liver with immunosuppression is not the same as having your own liver and no immunosuppression. So there's an impact on quality of life just from having a transplant. So you don't necessarily, you don't want a transplant if you don't need a transplant. Okay, thanks. Great, so I think at this point, uh, we'll probably uh, conclude our educational session for this evening. Um, I do, uh, Dr. Swain, if you're available at all to jump between any of the break rooms, um, maybe we have an opportunity to ask another question or two there. Uh, we thank you again for your time. Uh, I want to thank you for your wonderful session. As I said, every single time I learned so much um, from all of your sessions, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, as mentioned, this, this session will be available on the CLF website, our Facebook page and YouTube channel over the next few days. So join us for our next session in July as well. It's on viral hepatitis um, and an update on both hepatitis B and C. For more information on upcoming sessions and to register, uh, you can visit liver.ca slash LWLB at the start of each month. If you don't see the session posted yet or uh, for, for other information, please do check um, in a few weeks. Uh, sometimes we're just finalizing the so, uh, now we'll break into the breakout rooms. Uh, we'll be uh, at the bottom of your screen. You're going to see a button that says breakout room. Uh, please click the button. Give it a few seconds before you see the different groups available. Um, the, the groups will be split into regions or provinces. Some will be grouped together depending on how many attendees we have. Once again, we suggest joining the group that best fits your geographical location. 
um, and we'll have a wonderful CLF staff and volunteer or volunteer across the country moderating those breakout rooms. So bear with us here for a few seconds as we get the room set up. Um, for our French speaking community members across the country who wish to participate in breakout room discussions in French, please feel free to select the Quebec French group. Oh. Go ahead and pick your room. I just hate that mute button sometimes, honestly. Um, thanks everyone um, is that still here. Um, I hope you enjoyed the breakout sessions or the breakout rooms. I know I, I always like them because it's just a smaller setting. Um, before we conclude, I do want to mention that uh, we're going to be sending out a post session survey. Uh, we're going to send that to you though uh, later on. It won't automatically pop up today. Um, and thank you all for attending today's Living with Liver Disease session um, on coping with liver disease in NAFLD and NASH. Uh, should you have any additional questions at all or comments, or you simply want to stay up to date on everything liver health related, please connect with us via our social media channels highlighted on the screen or send us an email at clf at liver.ca. I really want to thank our sponsors um, for our Living with Liver Disease session. And of course, a big thank you to all those who attended and Dr. Mark Swain. We thank you all and have a great evening. Thank you.